straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. A suspect charged with shooting eight people at three massage parlors across Georgia. The alleged motive revealed by authorities. An issue with porn and that he was attempting to take out that temptation. Another delay in the trial of millionaire real estate heir Robert Durst accused of murdering his best friend, Susan Berman. What's in a letter the defendant mailed to the judge? May I give you the letter now? And sentencing for the admitted murderer of Bianca Devins, the time Brandon Clark will spend in prison for posting pictures of the victim's body on social media. My entire adult life, I've been Bianca's mom. Without her, I don't know who I am. Plus, two jurors in the Derek Chauvin trial excused after they were selected. Why they say they no longer can be fair and impartial following the $27 million settlement to the family of George Floyd. My gut reaction to that, again, with the, the dollar amount being high. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Jury selection has been slow while moving forward in the trial against Derek Chauvin. Law and Crime's Kim Johnson is in Minneapolis for us and is here to explain how the court took two steps back towards seating a jury. Yeah, Brian, it's been a piv pivotal day in the Derek Chauvin trial after two seated jurors were kicked off the trial saying that they could no longer be impartial. The reason is that announcement of a $27 million settlement between the city of Minneapolis and the family of George Floyd. After being brought back to court by a Zoom, two of the jurors said that they could no longer be impartial after hearing about the settlement. Listen to what one had to say when questioned by the judge. That dollar amount was kind of shocking to me. That kind of sent a message that the city of Minneapolis felt that something was wrong and they wanted to make it right to the tune of that dollar amount. Um, I think in the headline, if it would have said $2,000 versus $20 million, um, that's a big change. So I think that, that sticker price obviously shocked me um, and, and kind of swayed me a little bit, yes. The two jurors dismissed a Hispanic man in his 20s and a white man in his 30s. Both mentioned the large dollar amount, a record for Minneapolis as a reason for swaying their opinion. The remaining jurors requestioned, promised to remain impartial and agreed they could set aside news of the payout and just focus on the evidence presented in court. Now, a new juror has been seated in this trial. That brings a total to eight. Fourteen are needed, including two alternates. So jury selection continues on Thursday, even though Judge Peter Cahill could still move this trial or reschedule it in the wake of the city payout to the Floyd estate. Brian. Thanks, Kim. The prosecution asked one potential juror, a black male in his 40s, how he views someone who uses illegal drugs. He was selected to, to serve. Someone might say that if someone is taking illegal drugs and they're harmed, they have only themselves to blame for that too. What do you, what do you think of that statement? Uh, I would disagree with that. I mean, if I say disagree, meaning like you you are on drug, mm -hmm. then something happened to you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a tough one, but I, I think I'll be neutral and I'll not blame anybody first. I mean, still we do still have to go with the fact. Joining us today is the founder of Trial Methods, Alan Turkheimer. Alan, pleasure to have you, but let's jump right in. Can we start by, I don't know, you giving us your professional opinion of what you see from either side and maybe assigning a grade to, to both sides? I'm looking at some of the reasons why jurors are being excluded for cause or peremptories, and I think each side is doing exactly what they have to. If you think about it, if, you, if the defense likes a juror, the prosecution's going to get rid of that juror and vice versa. So I'm looking at this as a question of jury deselection, where you have a finite number of people, and each side is coming in, getting candid responses from a lot of the jurors, and then realizing, oh, this person's going to be too biased. And I think both sides are getting rid of those that they absolutely have to get rid of. So I think each side is doing a good job of trying to get rid of those negatively disposed to their case so far. And in terms of a grade, what would you do? Like A, B, or are they doing really well or just kind of good? I think they're doing pretty well. Uh, you know, I don't, I'd like to be sitting in there and uh, seeing the, the facial expressions and, and getting more information and tying their uh, responses to what they filled out in the questionnaire. But overall, I, I think each side is doing a, a nice job. And it looks like it's, it's going to be a, a more diverse jury than Hennepin County. And I think that usually proves for a, a better, more 
uh, rich, full of deliberation where more viewpoints are considered and things are recalled more accurately. Sounds good. Let's bring in co-host Terry Austin. Terry, what do you make of the judge's decision to bring in seven of the nine jurors and ultimately excuse two? You know what, Brian? Judge Cahill is doing his best to salvage this case. He called these jurors back and he asked them about this settlement and whether it would influence them. And he kicked out two of them who said that it would influence them. You know, there was a very similar case back in 2019 in the city of Minneapolis where they paid a $20 million settlement. It was the Knorr case. And they did that right before the jury came back, but they waited to announce the settlement. And I think they should have done that here because it's making it very difficult to get a fair and impartial jury. And I think the judge is really doing his best to try to make sure that he gets a fair jury and that we don't get a mistrial or have to delay the trial in any way. Now, Alan, only two alternates? That sounds crazy, right? And um, I know you already kind of touched on it a little, but if you have any, just a little tidbit of advice uh, as a consultant in this case, what would you give? You're right. Two alternates isn't that much. And uh, back to what you were talking about, I'm just going to say that phones automatically give updates, so it's not as if the jurors did anything wrong. They could just pick up their phone and see $27 million. But um, two alternates is not that that much at all. And maybe the judge will revisit it. It's uh, obviously a long trial. And, you know, with, with what people have going on in the world, and especially on the tail end of the pandemic, I think that maybe the judge should reconsider and see more than just two alternates. Yeah, and they'll probably have a lot of time as well because it looks like they may get to that number of 14 sooner rather than later. Alan Turkheimer, thank you very much. Uh, Terry, we'll see you in a moment. Be sure to tune in to the Law & Crime Network for gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the Derek Chauvin trial in the murder of George Floyd. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, the letter millionaire real estate heir Robert Durst wants the trial judge to see. But first, the sentence of a man accused of killing a 17-year-old girl in a way that shocked even our experts. The case you may not want to see, but got to hear. Next. We're back. A man who admitted to slitting a teenage girl's throat and posting photos of the murder on social media learns his punishment. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy has the emotional words from Bianca Devon's family at her killer's sentencing. Yeah, Brian, Bianca Devins was only 17 years old when she was murdered. Her mother and her younger sister told the court what Brandon Clark's actions have done to their family. Brandon Clark walked into the courtroom to learn his punishment for the murder of Bianca Devins in July 2019. Her sister spoke to the court. As we grew older, that dream turned into a goal. We were going to go to California together. We were going to make memories. Now memories is all I have to remember my sister. Bianca was only 17, planning to attend college to become a psychologist when Brandon Clark slashed her throat after they attended a concert together in Utica, New York. Clark then posted photos of Bianca's lifeless body on Instagram. Life as I knew it ended, when my daughter's life was violently cut short. Bianca was not only my daughter, but my best friend. Bianca's mother spoke of losing her oldest daughter. With the death of your child comes the most unimaginable, indescribable pain. A pain that time cannot heal and only seems to worsen. Life without Bianca will never be the same. Bianca suffered from mental illness, but her family said she had received help and was doing well. I hate myself for why I did the judge questioned Clark about why he had tried to withdraw his guilty plea. Clark pleaded guilty last year to second-degree murder. Five months later, he tried to withdraw that plea. The judge denied that request. Clark now claims he didn't understand how the criminal justice system worked. I have a history of mental health, and I feel like just accepting the maximum, I felt like I was doing myself a disservice that maybe, maybe I could get real help. Clark also mentioned wanting to write a book as a reason for withdrawing that plea. His words of regret offered little consolation to Bianca Devon's family. This man's words, trying to apologize, rang very hollow, very hollow. He had the opportunity not to do this crime, and he chose to do it in a callous manner, posting her death photos, videotaping the murder. Legislators in New York have actually introduced what they're calling Brianna's Law 
that law would actually hold social media companies uh, responsible for any graphic content posted on their site. Brian? Thanks, Anjanette. Back with us is Terry Austin. There are so many aspects of this case. The gruesome murder, the trying to take back the plea, the sentence, that I think just the best thing to do, because I heard your, both your reactions when we discussed this case, is just to hear your thoughts. Uh, Terry, let's begin with you. What did you think about this case overall? You know, this is the type of case where I think, Brian, it should be more than just 25 to life. Hopefully, when he comes up for parole, he will not be granted parole. I think the fact, obviously, it was a brutal murder, but it's exacerbated because he videotaped it and posted it. So now we have images that the family will have to think about. And you heard the sister during her victim impact statement where she talked about that image comes up in her mind over and over. So I really am hoping that, obviously, he is in prison for the rest of his life. Everyone was very upset by this, and that is, I think, the least they can do as far as this crime is concerned. It's going to be a very difficult parole hearing for the defendant if that does come about. I would agree with Terry. Uh, I don't see a very strong chance of him getting early release on parole in the first, second, or maybe even third time. And Jeanette, your thoughts about the case? Yeah, I would agree with Terry. I think the 25 years uh, for the parole eligibility is kind of a gift to him, and he probably won't get that parole. You can guarantee that family will likely be there to contest that parole uh, hearing or to contest his release when it happens. Absolutely horrifying, and I'm just not so sure that you can rehabilitate someone. Um, and I strongly believe that people can be rehabilitated, but I am not so sure that somebody who does something like this can be helped to the extent that they can rejoin society and be, um, you know, safe and con a contributing member of society who's not going to put people at risk. Now, Terry, I know most people will be asking the question, why not the death penalty in New York State? There is not one. Um, but if this did happen in another state with the death penalty, do you think that would have been on the table? Yes, absolutely. I do think the death penalty would have been on the table. And, you know, I wanted to mention one thing about getting parole. The fact, and this upset the judge. The fact that the initial plea was guilty and then he changed his plea, that really upset the judge. And I think when it comes up for parole, perhaps the family can mention that issue because that was very torturous. And so hopefully he will stay in prison. I don't think he can be rehabilitated. Anjanette was absolutely right about that. And, you know, these are terrible circumstances. Yeah. Of course, when you go to a parole hearing, that admissions of guilt is an aspect that they do look at in terms of the point system that they use for release. So him maybe going back on that could potentially have a negative effect on him. We'll obviously keep eyes on that. And Jeanette, Terry, thank you very much. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, the, the Georgia killing spree that left eight dead in three massage parlors and the motive you didn't see coming. Plus, what could it be? The mysterious letter millionaire real estate heir Robert Dirtz tried to have mailed to the judge, but brought to court. Should it be part of the court file? Our legal analysis next. Welcome back. The trial of millionaire real estate heir Robert Durst, accused of murdering his best friend, is delayed yet again. Robert Durst is charged with killing Susan Berman at her Hollywood Hills home in 2000. He was arrested in 2015, and his trial began on March 2, 2020. But it was put on pause after six days as the COVID-19 pandemic shut down the country. Durst's defense has been trying to get a mistrial declared, but the judge repeatedly has said jurors have been admonished not to look at the news and denied their request. A hearing is now scheduled for April 12th, and the trial is set to begin on May 17th. Do you agree to start on May 17th, Bob? I agree to start on May 17th. Very good. In court, Durst appeared to take out a letter out of his coat jacket. He says he mailed to the judge, but was returned. May I give you the letter now? Uh, it was returned to me stamped with return to sender insufficient address. My apologies. Here. Attorneys for Durst say they advise him not to give the judge a letter because it will have to be entered into the court's record. For now, we won't know what is in it. Meanwhile, attorneys continue to argue over the restarting of the trial. We have been uh, consistent and uh, objecting to the length of time that the jury's been 
at recess and at large, and we will continue to object to that. Additional thing, Your Honor, yes, we can Chairman. start on May 17th with a new jury Thank selection. You. Thank you, Mr. That'll Chairman. Be the, you know, that's what we're asking for. So we're not saying that we won't start on May 17th. We're just going to make a record as to why we think or how we think it should start. So one man's contradiction is another man's dilemma. Terry, you've been following this case closely. There are only so many things it could be. It's something the lawyer doesn't want Durst turning over. It could be part of the record, but it's unlikely something in furtherance of a crime. Care to guess what it could be? Only someone like Durst could write a letter to send to the judge right before the trial is going to start. I think he's going to underscore what his attorney is already saying, that making the same jury come back after all this time is unfair. And I think there's an argument to be made there. I think because of COVID, the judge delayed it, but, you know, start all over, pick a new jury. The other issue, Brian, is I think he could be saying that his health is declining, because clearly you can see there his health looks like it is declining. He mentioned that, you know, his hearing is impaired there. You heard his voice. It certainly is also impaired. So the letter might be saying, Judge, look, I need medical attention. Maybe take me out of jail. We will see, because in April there's going to be a hearing, so maybe we'll hear something about it then before the trial starts in May. But I'm also very curious what that letter has to say. Yeah, me too. I, I see the points that you're making, the health, uh, the arguments. He could be making those because maybe he feels, I don't know, my lawyers aren't doing a good enough job, so I've got to put my foot forward. But I don't know. He's, he's, a, he's a master manipulator. I've got to feel like it's something else. I hope at some point uh, we get to see it. But as a defense attorney, uh, I don't know. The defense attorney may go back and just rip that up a little before it gets to see the judge. But thanks, Terry. When we come back, the motive law enforcement is saying was behind the deadly killing spree that left eight dead and one wounded in three different massage parlors. Welcome back. New information in a spree of deadly shootings at three spas in Georgia. Law enforcement now say they don't believe the killing of eight people, including six Asian women, was racially motivated. 21-year-old Robert Long is accused of going on a deadly rampage near Atlanta on Tuesday evening. The shootings began in Cherokee County at Young's Asian Massage Parlor. The sheriff's office says two Asian women, one white woman, and a white man were killed inside. A fifth Hispanic male was injured outside the business and is recovering at a hospital. We're not sure what his presence was there, uh, and, we're, and the other people that were killed at the location, we're not going to say whether they were employees. Authorities say Long drove into the city of Atlanta and opened fire at two spas across the street from each other. Three people were killed at Gold Spa and another killed at Aromatherapy. Authorities say all four were Asian women. We certainly will not begin to blame victims, and as far as we know in Atlanta, these are legally operating uh, businesses that have not uh, been on, on our radar, not on the radar of APB. Investigators posted screenshots from surveillance cameras from the business to social media. They say his family came forward and identified him to law enforcement. A Georgia State Patrol officer spotted Long's car on the interstate and called for backup. They initiated a traffic stop and then uh, immediately pitted the vehicle. Uh, after the vehicle was pitted, the suspect was taken into custody without further incident and transported to the Chris County Jail. Long was interviewed by local authorities along with the FBI. The suspect did uh, take responsibility for the shootings. Um, he uh, said that early on once we began the interviews with him. Um, he claims that these, and as the chief said, we know this is still early, but he does claim that it was not racially motivated. He apparently has an issue, uh, what he considers a, a, a sex fiction, and sees these locations as something that allows him to, to, um, to go to these places, and, and it's a temptation for him that he wanted to eliminate. Deputies recovered a 9mm handgun from Long's car they suspect to be the murder weapon. Investigators are also coming through his social media accounts. He made a comment to that effect, that he was headed to Florida, and that he was going to do similar acts in that state. And the issue was that he wanted to destroy what had been tempting him? It That's sounds to me like these, these, this, these locations, he sees them as an outlet for him, mm -hmm. that something that he shouldn't be doing, and that uh, an issue with porn, and that he was attempting to take out that temptation. 
Long is currently in Cherokee County Jail. He's expected to go before a judge on Thursday. Terry, I see why the police don't believe this is a hate crime. His explanation, as we heard just there, kind of pulls that away, even though I don't think that's going to be quite much solace for the Asian American community. But is that fact that it's not racially motivated going to make this case any easier for him? I don't think so. I think they're going to go after him. Eight people dead. That is a lot of people, obviously. Look, he admitted to the shooting. He admitted that it was not racially motivated. They're going to investigate anyway because they have to make sure that it wasn't racially motivated. He actually said during his interview that because he was, you know, sexually driven, he had to kill these people to eliminate these motivations that he might have. I think the real question here, Brian, if they determine this was not hate motivated, I think they're going to have to figure out whether or not he understands the difference between right and wrong. I think he might try to assert an insanity defense. And if that is the case, I think they're going to have to look at this investigation, look at the questioning that occurred when they arrested him and see what his answers were as far as, you know, what his motivation was, what he was thinking, what his state of mind was at the time he committed these murders. Oh, it, does, it doesn't take a defense attorney to see what the defense is going to be here. First, is this person competent to stand trial? You're definitely going to see that examination. The next one, as you said, his answer, by definition, I have sex issues and therefore I need to go kill other people to make sure I don't. That's a mental health defense if I've ever heard one before, but we're going to keep eyes on that case and see how it goes. Terry, thank you for joining us, and thank you for joining us here at Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.